And so to start things off, we will ask uh, uh, Patricia if she will talk about the epidemiology of uh, per persistent post-surgical pain. Thank you very much. The story of, of chronic pain after surgery began almost 20 years ago in UK when 20% uh, of the patients attending the pain clinics say that the pain began after a surgical procedure. And long-term pain after surgery is a cause of disability, decrease the quality of life of the patient, and increase the need for the use of health care, so it's costly. If the professional, the healthcare professional, are aware of this problem, it's amazing to know, according to a recent survey, that 80% of the patients undergoing surgery are totally unaware that they can develop persistent pain after the procedure. Uh, this is the new definition of chronic pain after surgery. Uh, it's an adaptation of the first definition published uh, 10 years ago by McRae. And this new definition will be included in the new uh, classification of disease ICD-11. Here you can see highlighted in blue the change uh, which have been made. So it means that the pain uh, began after a surgical procedure and uh, or the pain increase in intensity uh, after the procedure. This is to uh, overcome the surgery-like orthopedic procedure uh, when the patient go to surgery uh, to remove the pre-operative pain. The duration of the pain is at least three months, better six months, and the pain is a continuum from acute post-operative pain or can develop after a free uh, interval after the procedure. Uh, pain is localized in the surgical area or in refer area and of course we need to exclude other causes for the pain like a cancer recurrence or infection. This is a picture of chronic pain after surgery today according to a recent uh, multicenter survey in Europe published in 2015 you can see that 12% uh, of the patients report moderate persistent pain at one year after surgery and for 2% of the patient, the pain is really bothersome, it's a severe persistent pain after surgery. And you can see that the incidence, the prevalence didn't change much, because already 10 years ago, um, Stubhock and Breivik published that one patient out of 10 will develop persistent pain after surgery, and for one patient out of 100, it will be very severe pain. It's important to realize that pain can develop, chronic pain after surgery can develop after any surgical procedure, even benign procedure. And there is a neuropathic component uh, in 30 to 60% of the patient complaining of persistent pain after surgery. And we know that when a neuropathic component is present in the pain, the pain is always more severe and the impact on the quality of life is worse. And today, one major risk factor is the severity, intensity, and duration of acute pain after surgery. Persistent pain after surgery is not only economic, but humanistic burden. And you can see on this picture that almost half of the patients reporting persistent pain after surgery also report depressive symptoms, sleep disturbance, and that 80% of the patients take at least two medications to relieve their pain. And sometimes those medications are not under prescription. And we are now all aware of the big opioid epidemic reported in the United States, but also probably existing in Europe. I think it's why it's really important to see the development of the transitional pain service, because this service could perhaps help to better control the problem. And the first report of this uh, transitional pain service um, really uh, showed the same observation as the clinical trials, meaning that the patient come to this service after thoracotomy or orthopedic procedure, and that 70% of the patients report a neuropathic component in their chronic pain after surgery. And those services are really important, you can see here on the slide, to control the pain and to control the pain uh, reliever intake by the patient. And you can see here that with this service you have a good control on the opioid and the gabapentinoid intake uh, to control 
a persistent pain after surgery. Thank you. Thank you for that very uh, complete report. I I'm interested because I see that things have really changed over the last 10 or 15 years in surgical techniques, in, in minimally invasive techniques. But what you're telling me is that the incidence of uh, persistent post-surgical pain hasn't changed in that time. I, I find that strange. Why, why is that the case? This is a very good question, an intriguing question. And I think uh, one answer to this question is probably that uh, persistent pain is like acute pain is individual related. So I think it's more individual factor uh, uh, which place people at risk to develop either severe acute postoperative pain or chronic pain after surgery than only the surgical procedure because you can develop, by example, this uh, persistent pain after surgery, after uh, mammoplasty or after a big uh, mammectomy. So it's not procedure related, it's more uh, individual related. Kenneth, it's nothing to do with the procedure, do you think, then? Well, I think that um, we have to compare uh, like with like. Uh, for instance, in the um, uh, lung cancer part, uh, 10 years ago, most uh, patients were treated with a thoracotomy, um, a, sp a procedure with a very high prevalence of um, persistent pain. Now these patients are treated with um, with what? Uh, with video assisted uh, thoracic surgery, which have a much lower uh, prevalence of uh, persistent pain. So when we compare, we need to compare the um, the, uh, the dis disease and, and not um, the procedure because the procedure prevalence would probably be the same. Okay, okay. So is there any comments from that? S so both Patricia and Kenneth are right. Um, we mustn't take a reductionist approach to the, to the idea of chronic pain. The simple incision is not the only trigger and the only uh, contributor. Uh, the patient itself, the, the pre-existing pathology, the adjunctive uh, therapies that go alongside that. So I think the idea that we can blame this entirely on the intraoperative incision is, is slightly simple, I think. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, Patricia, it's really most of these, the post-operative pain problems are, are reported in the inpatients. Uh, what about out outpatients and children? Is there any difference in uh, the instance of per persistent post-surgical pain related to adults and children? There is uh, a few studies uh, in the literature uh, to date showing the same prevalence for outpatient surgery, but it's not surprising because the pain is mainly related uh, to the individual, to the personality of the patient. And also in the children, more and more studies coming in the literature showing that chronic pain after surgery also exists for children with the same prevalence and also a neuropathic component very important in all these patients, old patients and children. And to add to that, th the neuropathic pain plays a prominent role. Do you think we have the tools available to actually trace the path of acute pain to a chronic neuropathic pain in the post-operative period? Do we have those available to us? This is or really should we? And it, this is really important because if we can early detect a neuropathic component, perhaps we can adapt the treatment and we can try to prevent the chronicization or at least to reduce the intensity of the chronic pain. And now, by example, we have very simple questionnaire, by example, the DN4, Dula Neuropathic 4, that we can apply early after surgery. And there is a very nice study by Hélène Belleuil and Valeria Martinez showing that this uh, neuropathic component can be detected as early as during the first two days after the surgery. And when a neuropathic component is present at 48 hours after the procedure, there is a very high risk to develop persistent pain, including a neuropathic component. Uh, Helene, would you uh, comment on that? Do you have a comment for that? Um, yeah, well, like uh, Patricia said, we showed that we can detect a neuropathic component uh, day two after surgery. It's predictive of uh, neuropathic pain three months after the surgery. But what we don't know and what should be the next study is that if we can have an impact with medication, with changing the treatment uh, at day two, does that have an impact three months later? We don't know yet about this. What are you using to detect the uh, neuropathic element? What sort of tools are you using for the that? The, the DN4 questionnaire. Just the uh, any, any uh, uh, practical tools or any uh, sensory testing tools at all? No, 
because uh, I've, we've been trying some of them, and uh, to my opinion, it's just my opinion, so far they're very difficult to use on a daily practice. It's too for, it's too for experimental, it's too for, for studies, but not to use on a daily practice. It's okay. too complicated. And, so this, and this is the important point here, that um, we may well have the tools, but do we have the resource or the clinical pathways to be able to utilize them? Do we have access to the patients before surgery? Do we have the ability to follow them up and see those that are, whose trajectory is splitting away? Or are we taking arbitrary, convenient time points to assess, which don't necessarily re reflect the pathophysiology? Okay. Does it any, uh, uh, Kenneth, any, any, uh, any uh, additions to that? No? The, the, big, the big question I also have is that we've talked about the instant of, of, of uh, post-operative post, uh, uh, pain. Um, you know, everybody's different, um, and we all respond slightly different. And although we talk a lot about the neuropathic and the nociceptive input to the surgery, um, what role do you think the person's psychological status actually plays with respect to, uh, to post uh, persistent post-surgical pain? I think personally it's very important too because you cannot dissociate uh, the, the psychological aspect of the physiological aspect. There is a relation between them and uh, we all know that uh, people with uh, high anxiety, catastrophizing, alexithymia, uh, all these patients are, are at higher risk to develop severe acute postoperative pain and also persistent pain after surgery. It's a well known risk factor. Can we uh, can we detect? Do we do do any psychological testing on patients, or can we do any simple set psychological testings for patients which have, uh, shall we say, predictive uh, effects? Yes, we we have this questionnaire. We have questionnaire for everything, <laughs> for anxiety, <laughs> catastrophizing. The problem is once again it takes some time, but the patients are very happy to fill in. Uh, all this questionnaire, but uh, as a doctor, you need to have the time to analyze the questionnaire and then to to implement uh, a strategy to try to to help those patients. And this is much more difficult to implement because uh, all psychological strategy, I, I think, is not only medication, but it's also uh, like hypnosis, mindfulness, and uh, it takes. Uh, a few time before the procedure to, to be successful. Mm -hmm. And it depends how much time you have between the, the first visit you see the patient and uh, the schedule of the surgical procedure. Okay. So, so th these are validated tools and there's no doubt in the research setting they've shown to be uh, efficacious and predictive. The translation is difficult. And at Bart's we're now beginning to think of an innovative way to collect that data, that is to, to give pe patients apps that they can use to to um, feed in their pre-existing pain data, but also their anxiety and catastrophizing before surgery in the preoperative clinic and at home as a means to be able to, to, to conduct that data in an efficient manner. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, that was uh, really interesting.